Hi folks, welcome to today's lecture. Um, my name is Katie, I'm from the Old Treasury Building. Uh, I'd first like to start off by acknowledging that the Old Treasury Building stands on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation. We pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Thank you all for coming along today to When ASIO Watched the House Fight with Hannah Viney. Uh, Hannah is a historian, PhD candidate and podcaster with a particular interest in women's political history in the Cold War. Her PhD at Monash University focuses on Australia's Australian women's anti-nuclear activism from 1945 to the 1970s. She's also the co-host of the Women of War podcast, which profiles individual women to explore the various ways women have been involved in wars throughout history. Hannah has an award-winning article in the Journal of Australian Studies and has been published in magazines like Wartime. She has also written for online publications such as The Conversation. Thank you, Hannah, take it away. Thank you, Katie. Uh, so to begin with, I would also like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and any First Nations listeners today. Sovereignty was never ceded. So, on the 10th of November 1949, Robert Menzies spoke to an audience in Melbourne a month before the upcoming federal election. As leader of the Liberal Country Coalition, Menzies reminded voters the policies the party pledged to enact if they were elected. These included the typical promises of full employment, economic prosperity and industrial growth. In addition to these, Menzies promised to dismantle the Communist Party of Australia, the CPA, and stamp out the alien and destructive pest that was communism in Australia. Menzies warned voters that communists were the most unscrupulous opponents of religion, of civilised government, of law and order, of national security. The coalition vowed to ban the CPA and make any outward show of support for the party illegal. This was an effective electoral strategy. On the 10th of December 1949, the Menzies Liberal Country Coalition was elected to government, a position that they would hold for the next 23 years. As Australia entered the 1950s, the country was still dealing with the aftermath of World War II, while also navigating the new normal of the Cold War. World War II, the first time a global war had reached Australia's shores, threw society into a state of upheaval. Social and cultural shifts arose as men went overseas to fight, women took on more paid employment, and thousands of US soldiers descended on Australian cities. After the war, more changes came with the influx of migrants fleeing the destruction in Europe. Many food staples were still being rationed and returning servicemen and women had to adjust to peacetime life. Gender roles had been upended during the war and now the nation faced conflicting ideas of what men and women could do going forward. All these changes and uncertainties resulted in a determined push towards conservatism. Australian politicians and media alike celebrated the more traditional family dynamics of the pre-war era, encouraging women to settle into a natural role as homemakers while men continued to provide for the family as breadwinners. The Cold War exacerbated Australians' feelings of instability. Immediately after the war, when everyone wanted to settle down into peacetime, it appeared that global tensions were rising again as the United States and the Soviet Union attempted to push their own ideologies across the globe. Australia, as an ally of the US and thus the Western capitalistic political bloc, watched with apprehension as Soviet-sponsored communism gained a foothold in the Asia-Pacific region. As countries in Asia began to gain their independence from colonial rule, in the mass decolonization of the post-war era, the possibility that these newly independent countries would adopt a communist political system inflamed Australian anti-communist sentiment. Australians were particularly wary of the domino effect, which was the belief that once one country fell to communism, it would be inevitable that countries around them would also fall. The brewing tension in Korea between the communist forces in the North and the US occupied South alongside communist efforts to overthrow the government in Malaya and the communist victory in China in October 1949, combined to make many Australians anxious about international communism. Internally, the CPA had risen to a height of 13,450 members by 1946. Prominent Australian communist Lance Sharkey, General Secretary of the party, publicly proclaimed in March 1949 that the workers would support a Soviet invasion of Australia 
comments for which Sharkey was tried and convicted, convicted for sedition. Moreover, the late 1940s saw several months long strikes, which many believed were efforts from the CPA, who were influential in Australian trade unions, to destabilise Australian industry. In early 1948, railway men in Queensland went on strike for nine weeks, while between June and August 1949, over 20,000 coal miners went on strike for seven weeks, demanding a 35 hour working week, better pay and long service leave. All these events seemed to prove to the Australian public how disruptive domestic communism was and how potentially destructive CPA activities could be. Many Australians feared that communists were a fifth column for the Soviet Union, working to bring down Australian democracy from within as part of a global Soviet sponsored communist plot. Anti-communism was further stirred by popular movements such as the Returned Servicemen's League Anti-Communist Vigilance Corps. One of the most influential was the Catholic Social Studies Movement, founded by lawyer B.A. Santa Maria in the early 1940s. Members of the movement gained positions within the Australian Labor Party, causing internal discord that would lead to the Labor split of 1955 and the creation of the Australian Labor Party Anti-Communist, which would later become the Democratic Labor Party. So this movie from the National Film Board from 1952, uh, while Australian soldiers were serving in the Korean War, offers a clear example of the messages around communism Australians were being exposed to. Today in Australia, Reds openly preach their gospel, flout our laws and form a growing menace to the future of this country. Does that disturb you? It should. Because today, five-sixths of Europe and Asia are under the iron heel of communism. This imperialistic tyranny is advancing with a speed and power unprecedented in the previous history of aggression. By 1950, it had subjugated 800 million people. To stem the red tide, United Nations troops now fight on foreign soil. Australians are joined in the fray, serving alongside American, British, New Zealand and Allied men. Active communist fighting fronts have been opened up in Indochina, Malaya and the Philippines, where communist satellites trained and armed by their overlords in Moscow carry on intensive warfare. They carry the flag of world revolution. Even now, their eyes are on the rice fields of Indochina, the rubber of Malaya, the copra of New Guinea, and the oil of Borneo. And one of the biggest prizes of all, Australia. Be assured they will not remain indifferent to the wealth this country can provide. Are we prepared to barter our free way of life for a system more barbaric than any devised by the Roman emperors? You say, like hell we are. Brave words. Only we cannot change the course of history with words. It's time to decide, each one of us, what we can do. Australia has 13,000 miles of coastline to defend. That's why we need increased defence forces. Communism everywhere seeks to give a fighting edge to hunger and misery. That's why we need increased production and economic and social development, so that we can help our less fortunate friends and neighbours in the near north. The governments and people of India, Pakistan, Burma, Ceylon and Indonesia are in general opposed to communism. But they are faced with appalling problems threatening their political and economic stability. Here in the Russian sector in Germany is a typical example of the worldwide drive which is being made to enslave the minds, hearts and souls of millions of young people. A few years ago, their fathers were fighting Russia. Today, they are taught to wave the hammer and sickle of communism. The same emblems of tyranny are to be seen in Australia today. Little knowing what they do, our youth are learning to pipe to the tune called by Moscow. Their communist banners and slogans talk of peace and friendship. Peace and friendship with whom? The communists 
the very people that these men are going to fight so that democracy can survive? Let us all face the grim facts like these Australians. United we will stand. Divided most assuredly we shall fall. Remember France. Self-interest and lack of unity were her downfall. Think it over. Tomorrow it may be too late for tears. Amid all this fear and uncertainty, Menzies began work on banning the CPA in early 1950 by putting forward the Communist Party Dissolution Bill. The bill declared the CPA an unlawful organisation and called for the party's property to be dispersed. Any organisations or bodies affiliated with the Communist Party or who were suspected of being a CPA front were to be dissolved, and any CPA members who continued to act in the interests of the party after dissolution would face up to five years imprisonment. The bill offered a broad definition of who could be considered a communist, declaring that communists were any who supported or advocated the ideals, principles or teachings of communism as outlined by Marx and Lenin. Anyone who fit this description would be barred from employment in the Defence Forces or in the Commonwealth Public Service and would also be prohibited from holding any official positions in industrial organisations or trade unions. For many Australians, the war in Korea demonstrated that there would be a world war fought over communism and they were convinced by Menzies' positioning of the bill as part of a wider effort for Australian national security and defence. Though the Communist Party Dissolution Act 1950 passed on the 19th of October, the CPA and 10 unions successfully applied to the High Court of Australia for an injunction, which prevented the government from implementing the Act. A few months later, in March 1951, the High Court further declared that the Act was unconstitutional. Menzies pushed the Governor-General to call a double dissolution of both the House of Representatives and the Senate with the hope that the Liberal Country Coalition would be returned with a majority in both houses and would be able to easier push through legislation. The party was victorious and so on the 5th of July 1951, Menzies introduced the Constitution Alteration Powers to Deal with the Communists and Communism Bill to put to the nation in a referendum that would change the Constitution to allow the government to ban the CPA. Voters were asked, do you approve of the proposed law for the alteration of the constitution entitled Constitution Alteration Powers to Deal with Communists and Communism, 1951? On both sides of the referendum, there were sustained and determined campaigns. The Yes campaign exploited Australian fears of domestic and international communism, which a majority of Australians now believed was the leading issue for the country, according to opinion polls. On the other hand, the dense legal jargon of the bill made it difficult for the layperson to understand exactly what it proposed. This allowed the No campaign to argue that the new legislation would give the government powers that went beyond banning the Communist Party. The leader of the opposition, H.V. Evatt, argued that there was already policies in place the government could use if it seriously wanted to combat communist subversion. Therefore, Evatt argued, the proposed legislation was a way for the government to create a totalitarian regime. Similar problems plagued the 1999 Republic referendum. The nation went to the polls on the 17th of September and the referendum was defeated by a narrow margin of 52,673 votes, which out of 44 referendums since Federation, only eight have actually been carried. Though Australians had ultimately decided to vote against giving the government the power to ban the CPA, this was by a very narrow margin and so distrust of communism was still quite widespread. Many Australians were still convinced that the Communist Party planned to overthrow democracy within the country and saw any cause that the CPA supported as part of this communist conspiracy. The communist presence in trade unions made unions a subject of suspicion, while the growing peace movement was also tarred by an association with communism. Though the Australian peace movement had dropped off during World War II, as many who argued against war believed in the importance of fighting fascism, Peace activism was on the rise again in the 1950s with the threat of the nuclear arms race. Globally and nationally, many were appalled after seeing the devastation wrought by the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of the war in the Pacific. Many were convinced that the development of nuclear weapons would lead to World War III, and they were also concerned about the dangers of radioactive fallout from nuclear weapons testing. <laughs> 
The dangers of nuclear testing seemed particularly worrisome for many Australians due to the geographical proximity to British nuclear tests at Maralinga in South Australia, and then later French tests in the Pacific. Peace organisations mounted public campaigns for nuclear disarmament and an end to nuclear testing. This may have been controversial enough on its own as attitudes towards nuclear weapons were conflicted in Australia, as many believed that nuclear weaponry could be essential for domestic defence. But added to this was the public presence of the CPA in peace activism. The Communist Party was a prominent advocate for peace and nuclear disarmament. This was in part due to Soviet policy at the time, which positioned the Soviet Union as a supporter of nuclear disarmament and thus a more peaceful nation than the US. The CPA was also central in other Australian peace organisations, including the Australian Peace Council, which was a CPA subsidiary organisation and one of the largest peace groups in this period. These connections meant that many Australians viewed any peace organisations or peace activists as either communists themselves or communist stooges. And so there was widespread distrust of the Australian peace movement. The Australian Convention of Peace and War, held in 1953, highlights the strength of this distrust. Though the convention asserted in their advertising that the word peace is not the property of any one group or section of people, it is the hope of all men everywhere. The event was organized by the Peace Council and so very few believed this statement of neutrality. The convention was subject to ASIO surveillance and interference and the Menzies government issued public statements linking the event with communist subversion. Added to this was religious condemnation from Catholic figures attempting to discredit the many Protestant attendees. All this combined to undermine the convention and ensured that a large, large proportion of the Australian public believed the event to be a communist ploy. ASIO itself was officially founded in March 1949, with the primary focus on combating subversive activity, defined as conduct or speech directed against the authority of the state with the ultimate intention of overthrowing the system of government. ASIO was ordered to defend the nation against actions or persons and organisations, whether directed from within or without the country, which may be judged to be subversive of the security of the Commonwealth. ASIO saw three categories of subversive activity, sabotage, espionage, and propaganda. For the first Director General of ASIO, Geoffrey Reed, the CPA fit the bill, and so he directed agents to establish themselves within the Communist Party, trade unions, and other affiliated organisations. The widespread anti-communism of, of the time meant that ASIO agents saw their work against the CPA as almost a religious mission. ASIO agents and informants believed that they were the vanguard in an internal and external war against communist aggression. This meant that not only was monitoring the CPA and card-carrying members of the party justified, ASIO was also justified in monitoring any individual who might be remotely connected to the party or who might be a secret communist sympathiser. Red terror in the US, fed by figures like Senator Joseph McCarthy and the execution of the Rosenbergs as Soviet spies, seemed to show that communists could be hiding in plain sight. This would again seemingly be proven in 1954 in Australia with the defection of the Petrovs who worked with the Soviet embassy before, being, before providing evidence of Soviet espionage in exchange for asylum. These events would lead to the Royal Commission on Espionage to investigate the extent of Soviet spies in Australia and which found no evidence of Australians helping Soviet spies. But regardless of these findings, many Australians had communist and communist spies on their mind in the mid 1950s. Much of ASIO surveillance of suspected communists was undertaken by B1 branch or the counter subversion branch. Their duty was to collect, collate, evaluate and distribute information on individuals, organizations and movements whose objectives or activities were considered subversive to the security of the Commonwealth. Among those who ASIO thought might pose a threat to the Commonwealth, such as Russian aliens or leaders of the CPA, were ordinary Australian women who had never been a part of the Communist Party or expressed any public support for communism or the Soviet Union. Among ASIO files on supposed communist agitators were files on women who publicly campaigned for peace, including, for example, members of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, an apolitical, largely middle-class group of women focused on generating interest in peace and human rights. In the course of my PhD research on women involved in the anti-nuclear movement, 
I found many ASIO files documenting their activities. What is inside the ASIO files themselves is sadly largely uninteresting, mostly consisting of lists of names of people who attended various meetings, who spoke to who on the telephone, copies of birth and marriage certificates, and an occasional newspaper clipping. What is intriguing is that someone in ASIO decided that these women were worth the effort, time, and money it would take to keep an eye on them. Even when ASIO agents were confident that an individual woman was not connected to the CPA, they still deemed it worthwhile monitoring her activities. In 1959, for example, the Director General of ASIO wrote to the Minister of External Affairs, reassuring him that although Anna Rowland, who was then Honourable Secretary of the Women's International League, has been associated with the WILPF for many years and as an office bearer has been associated with Communist Front activity, there was evidence that she is not sympathetic to the Communist Party of Australia and is a sincere pacifist. So why were these women targeted for ASIO surveillance? Their association with the peace movement could have been enough and probably was, but as was shown later with ASIO surveillance of women's liberation figures, ASIO's determination of their subversive potential could also have been exacerbated by their visibility as women engaging in political and activist campaigns. In the wake of World War II, the increasingly prominent and visible position of women in the paid workforce challenged attitudes towards gender and sexuality. While the men were away fighting, women had been needed in the essential roles men had left behind. This was nothing new for working class women, but a lack of male workers meant that many middle class women were required to undertake paid employment on a much larger scale than ever before. By the end of the war, around 30% of women were in paid employment outside the home. This new dynamic challenged the accepted understanding of gender and the gender division of the public and private spheres, which all then fed into the Cold War anxieties about the deterioration of Australian society. There were consequently some public figures who argued that women who refused to return to their pre-war domestic roles full time were in fact depriving not only their children of the moral guidance of mothers, but even depriving society itself of the stabilizing influence of the homemaker and housewife. To alleviate such anxieties, both the government and the Australian media emphasized the natural roles of men and women in an effort to use familiar conventional gender roles to combat national insecurity. Women involved in peace activism particularly those who campaigned in protest marches and who gave talks on radio programs about their activism, clearly did not fully embody the happy housewife stereotype that many politicians in the media wished they did. In response to the heightened conservatism of the early 1950s, the Cold War saw a revival of maternalist politics. More radical groups, such as the Union of Australian Women, which was tied to the CPA through its members and through the peace equals communism mentality, adopted an unmistakably maternalist politics to counter any negative associations between them and the CPA. The UAW had been formed in August 1950 to campaign for working class mothers and housewives. In order to continue to advocate for women and peace despite rampant anti-communism, the UAW emphasised their organisation as a voice for mothers and emphasised their own supposed adoption of more conservative femininity. Alongside articles about domestic and world politics, the UAW magazine Our Women also included recipes, fashion and household tips. The organisation emphasised women's nurturing and caring natures and positioned their activism as stemming from a woman's natural concern for her children. UAW women also used items associated with, with femininity such as aprons and handbags to protest by covering these items with peace slogans. Even broadly popular spaces such as the Australian Women's Weekly magazine used a feminised politics to counteract any concerns about their encouragement of women's political interests. The weekly combined coverage of Cold War politics with conventionally feminine issues such as raising children and marriage in order to retain their popularity and circulation numbers while still being able to advocate for Australian women's political engagement. The conscious adoption of overt femininity was and is a frequent and historic tactic used by women's organisations and women's movements that pushed the limits of acceptability. The maternal frame has been employed by women activists, not only to achieve their goals, but also to protect women from any form of scorn for their actions. Suffragists campaigning for women's right to vote at the end of the 19th and into the early 20th centuries 
emphasise women's natural morality and mothering instincts to argue for women's right to enfranchisement. In Australia, after women had achieved the vote, maternal feminists continued to use a respectable maternal image to argue for further political rights. These women argued that since citizen soldiers were entitled to full political rights as a reward for their wartime service to the nation, women should also be entitled to such rights for their continued service to the nation, providing healthy white children. Thus, by emphasising their maternal role, women could outwardly change the status quo while still holding on to some level of respectability. Women campaigning for peace in the early Cold War also adopted this overtly feminine and maternal image. Pamphlets put out by organisations such as the Women's International League repeatedly emphasised that women had a duty as mothers to campaign for peace. In 1959, no Australian delegates from the League were able to attend the upcoming World Congress of Mothers, but they still sent and published a telegram on behalf of the Australian section of the League, emphasising that, quote, as children come not from us, but through us, so may we women be life's instruments for bringing peace and freedom to the world of tomorrow, end quote. Speaking in 1957 at the Third World Congress against A and H bombs held in Japan, Nancy Lapwood spoke of her experiences as a mother and her passionate desire for, quote, life for my children, a full, interested, happy, creative life in the service of others, but first of all, life, end quote. After the conference, Eileen Palmer, though not a mother herself, wrote that it was women's position as mothers that was the reason they were beginning to understand they must take a foremost place in the struggle against A and H bombs. Palmer suggested in a press statement on the conference that, quote, the threat to their children, which radioactive fallout from tests may represent, has roused large numbers of women to action in many countries, end quote. At the women's session of the 1959 Peace Congress in Melbourne, 300 women gathered to hear Jaquetta Hawkes and Ava Pauling, the wives of prominent British anti-nuclear campaigners J.B. Priestley and Linus Pauling, talk of the particular role women had to play for disarmament as, quote, they had a special understanding of the genetic effects of atomic radiation on present and future generations, end quote. At protest marches for peace and disarmament, women were regular participants, often bringing their children or grandchildren with them and holding signs that emphasised their maternal responsibilities. Photos from such marches show women smiling and respectably dressed in their heels and pearls, the picture of middle-class respectability. They hold their children's hands and push babies in prams, with the children bearing banners demanding, let us live. Women attending such marches were encouraged to wear peace aprons or carry peace flags and balloons. And this instruction they followed and they often wore white aprons with slogans such as peace, not pieces. No French tests or even handbags with phrases such as, we want a safe world for our children. They carried umbrellas and walked dogs and wore hats with delicate flowers on them. These are not ostensibly radical women. Instead, these women are young mothers, grandmothers, matronly figures. Many marched in blocks together as women, sometimes as a group from women's organisations, such as the Women's International League or the Union of Australian Women. While no doubt many women involved in peace campaigning did draw their motivation from a maternal care for their children, and did embody the image of respectable femininity they projected. There were also women for whom this was a conscious choice. Women were aware of the perception of the peace movement and consciously chose to distance themselves from the taint of communism. For some, like Carol Goldson, they were personally sympathetic to the communist ideology, but were aware of what publicly aligning with the CPA might do. Carol never joined the CPA, but her parents had been members and she had grown up surrounded by positive representations of communist ideas. As a child, Carol had been taught anti-communist thinking by the nuns at her Catholic primary school, but she grew to realise it could not be all that bad if it was something her parents believed in. Carol was not tempted to join the party formally, mainly due to her father's own unhappiness with the actual organisation of the CPA, but she was open to communist ideas and believed she would, have been, she would have voted for a communist candidate in federal or state elections if given the chance. However, she was also aware of the difficulties that could arise if she joined communist aligned peace organisations. When Carol joined the Victorian campaign for nuclear disarmament in the early 1960s, she consciously joined a non-party political organisation as she, quote, 
felt it was probably better to be part of an organization that didn't have those associations, end quote, with communism. Carroll knew that, quote, people were much more wary of people who rocked the boat on any issue, end quote. For her, it boiled down to the fact that it didn't look good. And she reasoned that, quote, it would have more appeal to a more general, non-politically committed demographic, end quote, if efforts for peace came from groups not aligned to any political mindset. In the early 1950s, the Cold War looks like it might turn hot any minute. And many Australians feared that members of the Communist Party of Australia were part of a global plot to destroy Australian democracy from within. The decade opened with the newly elected Prime Minister determinedly attempting to ban the CPA, a prospect that was only narrowly defeated. The CPA's close involvement with the peace movement and nuclear disarmament movement tarred the entire peace movement with the same brush. And many Australians felt that anyone campaigning for peace was either a communist or a communist stooge. ASIO set out to uncover and expose any subversive elements who threatened Australian democracy. As part of this mission, many Australian women came under ASIO's spotlight. To a modern audience, it might seem odd that someone who could sit in the dictionary under 1950s housewife could be the target of the Australian intelligence service. But women's lives in the 1950s were far more complicated than what many today believe. Women who participated in the peace movement not only risked suspicion from their supposed ties to communism, but also for daring to step outside the kitchen at a time when public figures and politicians were encouraging them to focus on the home and their family. So women followed in the paths laid by early women's activists and put forward a very particular image of respectable women who were only campaigning because of their desire to protect their children. Many women did embody this figure, but there were also others who knew the power of the image of a doting mother and the power that image could have to perhaps turn away ASIO's eye. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was fascinating. Um, I, it, it still boggles my mind what it must have been like at that time. You know, the whole reds under the bed scare. It mm -hmm. just, I can't imagine anything like it. If you'd like to find out more about women's activism, you can check out OTB's online exhibition, Protest Melbourne. It's available on our website and eventually when we can open, uh, it will be in person. But Hannah, you said that not every woman in the ASIO archive was a member of the Communist Party. What proportion do you reckon it was? Oh, that's a hard question to answer. <laughs> ASIO, <laughs> shockingly, shockingly, it's really hard to get ASIO files released. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to know if someone has an ASIO file. So it's a multi-year long process of you sending in a request saying, I think this person might have an ASIO file. Can you maybe check and let me know? Um, and then you might hear an answer two years later if you're lucky. So it would, it would really be hard to tell because there's, there's a woman I'm sure has an ASIO file based on her activities and I haven't got anything. So in terms of statistics, that would be a project that you might be able to do in 50 years, I think. <laughs> but hey, you know, you've got a long time to do research. <laughs> Maybe put in the request now. <laughs> yep, yep. All right, next question. Uh, can you tell us what the high point of CPA membership was in Australia and how that overlapped with the various peace groups? So the highest uh, point of CPA membership was 1946. Uh, it was just after the war. And so that was kind of the early rise again of the peace movement, because as I said, the peace movement had kind of dropped off in Australia and around the world during the war because everyone agreed pretty much that Hitler was a bad guy and we should probably do something about him. Um, but after the war, the nuclear threat meant the peace movement rose. But at the same time, communist membership dropped um, after 1946, partly that because of a whole lot of factors regarding the Soviet Union um, and what's happening over there. So Stalin died in the early 1950s, um, which you know, some people were very on Stalin's side, some people were very not on Stalin's side. Uh, and then about 1956, Khrushchev, who was then the Premier of the Soviet Union, gave a secret speech that was very not secret about all the crimes Stalin had committed. So at that point, membership of the Communist Party dropped significantly, um, as many people kind of wanted to distance themselves from that. So yeah, the height of communism in Australia was 1946, and it's gone down since then. Wow, 
Fascinating. Um, were any housewives actually prosecuted? There were some who were prosecuted for sort of disturbing the peace a little bit. Um, it was quite minor at this time. So it was sort of, you were standing in the wrong place because a lot of Australian cities at this time are quite strict on how you could protest and when you could protest, um, which was one of the reasons for peace aprons because you couldn't carry placards. But if you had a slogan on your apron, then you blurred the lines a bit, of, little bit. But there were some women who were arrested for that. But sort of in terms of large numbers of housewives being arrested, that's probably when you get into Save Our Sons um, and anti-Vietnam protests, and a lot more were arrested at that point. Oh, and was any um, state more active than the others? It's very East Coast based. Um, so Melbourne, Sydney, even Brisbane. Uh, the biggest points of activism in this period. Um, which It's surprising that there's less activism in South Australia particularly, since that was where there was nuclear tests. And so in my head, that would make sense. You'd have a lot more people protesting around the point where you're closest to the nuclear fallout. But I think it's demographic based. So there's a lot more people on the East Coast. You know, that's where our population is densest. And so that's where you're going to get more people actually going out to protest. Fair enough. Uh, there were several communist and socialist parties in the Menzies era and after. Do you think ASIO understood these differences? No, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> A ASIO is very interesting in this period. Um, there's a lot of, I don't want to say incompetence, but sort of incompetence. Um, it's very early on in ASIO's lifespan um, so it's still figuring out how to run things to an extent and then there is just sort of this overwhelming sense of communism equals evil and so it sort of did blur some of the lines between you know good and bad so socialism which is not communism but um, at this time was kind of equated so there's actually an ad that if you go on youtube you can find an ad from the liberal party in the 1950s for the 1949 election um, that the Liberal Party recently uploaded again, which I find a bit odd. Um, and so this ad talks about how socialism is bad. So they're really talking about how communism is bad, but they use the word socialism. So there is that overlap at mm -hmm. the time. And so AVO as well kind of fell into that, not really understanding all the differences and nuances. Everyone who's vaguely potentially kind of maybe related to communism, they're bad. Hmm. Wow, how bizarre. Uh, um, does your study continue through the 1970s? If so, have you been able to access on ASIO and Save Our Sons, including Jean McLean? Sorry, I think I read that wrong, but you get my drift. My project doesn't. It finishes about 1965. Uh, so the reason for that is that in 1965, you do have the anti-Vietnam War movement, which explodes. And pretty much, so my focus is on anti-nuclear activism and anti-Vietnam activism subsumes that. So pretty much all anti-nuclear activists kind of stop almost overnight and start protesting the war and conscription. So that there's a lot that's been published on that. So I kind of do the pre-period. Um, I would like to continue 1970s women's activism and anti-nuclear activism perhaps after the PhD, because there is a big, anti-nuclear movement in the 1970s um, and there's women's peace camps at Pine Gap in the Northern Territory. Um, so that's quite a big thing. So that would be interesting to see. Um, if you want to know more about Save Our Sons, particularly yeah, there's a book that's just come out um, from Caroline, I want to say Collins, but don't quote me on that, but it's called Save Our Sons from Monash University Press. Um, and that's a really good in-depth look at that. So I recommend that. Excellent. We uh, we might include the reference for that when we send out the recording. We can do that. Excellent. Um, you mentioned that ASIO spied on the women's liberation movement. Is it possible to view that evidence? Oh, that's a good question. That's not my area of expertise. I just know it happened. <laughs> um, so there is a few um, books and things around ASIO um, that would cover that. So there's one book which was forget what it's called, but it's basically um, activists from around the 1970s who looked at their own ASIO files um, and their reflections on that. 
So that would probably be a good place to start. I will hunt up the name of it and <laughs> we can send that out as well. Um, so yeah, that's probably the best way. So I can't actually answer that question, I'm sorry. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, on the ASIO files, is there a large amount of information in them? Um, and how do you go about looking at one, requesting it? So to request an ASIO file, I'll start with that, you go to the National Archives um, and there's actually a page. So if you Google National Archives of Australia ASIO, that will come up with a page where you can request it. So how to request a file if it's not already released is that you put in all the information you have, so name, any possible aliases, the time they're active, why you think they might have an ASIO file, so for example, member of the CPA. And you send that through and the National Archives then forwards that onto ASIO and then sacrifice a goat and, you know, summon a demon if you need to so that you can hopefully get a response <laughs> in a not too long a period. Um, there are some ASIO files that are already released and so to find them, you can look on the National Archives um, record search and you just type in the name and that will bring up any ASIO files that have already been released. And most that are released are digitized. That's as correct. for what's in them, it's it's not as exciting as you think it is, <laughs> sadly. <laughs> Some of them had quite detailed information. Um, not many of my women did because they weren't really doing anything dangerous to the Commonwealth. So there wasn't much for ASIO to find. Mostly what I found is that most isn't redacted, which is good. You can see most of the stuff that's in the files, it, but it's a lot of photocopied letters and a lot of so-and-so went to this meeting and they sat with these 20 other people. So it's a list of names. So it sort of depends what you want to get out of it and what you want to see in the ASIO file. But then th there would have been figures that don't come up in my research that like the Petrovs who would have had far more extensive files because they were actually doing things that ASIO could talk about. Mm. Interesting. Um, Timothy, oh, this will be our, our last question, I think. Uh, Timothy Garton Ash's publication, The File, looked at his own Stasi file and talked about how much sources might be used in the creation of history. Are you aware of any similar analysis using ASIO files? As I said, there is that book that's about mm -hmm. um, activists looking at their own ASIO files. So that's probably in that vein. There is, so ASIO files, there's a few studies that are more recent, a few PhDs that have just been published and stuff, um, which are looking at how you can use ASIO files. So I think it's something that, that's coming. Um, it's not a big part of my own research. So it's sort of, there's other people who know a lot more about ASIO files than I do. <laughs> so they're probably the best person to ask for those. But I think, I think there will be an interest in that coming as well. I think a growing interest in that. Yeah, I think so. It seems like a, a um, point of history that people are really beginning to really get interested in. Not to say they weren't interested before, but there seems to be a lot about it around at the moment. I mean, spies are cool. I mean, they're not, but they are. <laughs> so I, I think that there's an element of that that you just start getting interested in it. Um, and I think there's a growing interest in the Cold War and how it affected places outside the US and the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So until a couple of decades ago, that was really the focus of Cold War history, was Soviet Union, US, they're fighting each other, that's it. Um, but last few decades, there's been a lot more research on how countries outside that were affected. Um, and so I think that will help push these kind of things, like ASIO came about because of the Cold War. So that will push research interest in ASIO. Fair enough. Beautiful. Well, thank you again, Hannah. It was a, a lovely way to spend an afternoon. I'm sure we've all learnt a lot. And um, if if um, anyone's interested, I hope you will be, uh, we've just announced our next lecture uh, to be held the 1st of November. Uh, it's called Love It or Loathe It, The Melbourne Cup and Australian History with Dr. Andrew Lemon. So that's available now on our um, event right page or our website. Uh, thank you again, Hannah. Just wonderful. And if anyone has any questions, um, send them through the contact form on our website and we'll get them to Hannah. Thank you very thank much. You. And you can see my details on the screen. So feel free to stalk me on the internet. <laughs> thank you for having me. Thank you.